Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Community Contact Tracing, a Method to Modernize and Enhance Contact Tracing with Location Data. This will introduce the concept of community contact tracing, the addition of location information to contact tracing to improve awareness of where viral spread may be occurring outside of direct and prolonged contact between two individuals. My name is Shannon Valzon, and I will be your moderator today. We are joined by Dr. Esty Garrity, the Chief Medical Officer and Health Solutions Director at Esri. She leads a team of health and human services subject matter experts who for the past few months have worked tirelessly with organizations like yours to support COVID-19 response. One of those team members is Jonathan Garrido-Leca, a solutions engineer who will also be joining us and showcasing the ArcGIS capabilities for community contact tracing. And now I'd like to welcome Esty and Jonathan and turn it over to them. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar focused on community contact tracing, which, uh, as Shannon said, is an enhancement to traditional contact tracing approaches. So as she said, I'm Esty Garrity, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Esri. I'm also a certified contact tracer. Uh, and my colleague, Jonathan garrido uh has actually been working directly with a number of governments in community contact tracing uh, activities and efforts. Let me begin with an overview of who this webinar is directed toward and what we'll cover in the next 50 minutes. As we prepared this webinar, we made some assumptions that those who are joining are probably in some way involved in contact tracing activities and understand the basic workflow of contact tracing. Uh, this is likely folks from government agencies. And while clearly contact tracing is being done in many places around the world, I will be making a few comments near the end that are focused on US privacy laws. The rest of the information should be broadly applicable across most geographies. Now, we believe that folks will be most successful in employing community contact tracing efforts if they already have some GIS experience in their workforce. The enhancement to contact tracing that we're suggesting is actually small, but it's quite powerful, and it may require you to have an open mind about altering and modernizing the traditional and longstanding methodology. Now, in terms of what we'll cover today, we'll start with a basic introduction and then work through the steps of uh, data collection and management, location-based analysis, decision support and evaluation, and then I'll cover some HIPAA considerations to help you decide if the solution could work for your organizations. We expect that we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for your questions. So let's begin with something you probably already know. We tend to use traditional contact tracing methods in the earliest stages of outbreaks when human-to-human -human transmission is occurring in a relatively limited way. In this approach, the workflow helps to identify specific people who've been in contact with a confirmed case. Now, with this information, we can trace the infection back to a family member, a friend, or a coworker. The case can then isolate for the duration of their infectious period, and any identified contacts can quarantine. So altogether, this is a really powerful intervention that lets us define and then break the transmission chains and stop outbreaks while they can still be contained. Traditional contact tracing, again, focuses on identifying specific people. But people move around. Uh, they shop at the grocery store. They eat at restaurants, and they go to the movies. Unfortunately, in a pandemic, every public place provides an opportunity for community transmission, where the source of new infections often can't be traced to known contacts. With COVID-19, as you know, We've long ago crossed over from human-to-human -human transmission to community transmission of the virus. And frankly, this isn't too surprising given our innate mobility and our interconnectedness. It's actually pretty easy to imagine that a new case might become infected in a store or a cafe or 
on the beach where you can be surrounded by people you don't personally know. In those cases, the traditional contact tracing process is going to miss key potential exposures that come with community transmission. And as a result, public health departments could form an incomplete picture of what's occurring, which then inhibits our ability to take the most informed actions to reduce risk and protect our communities. Community contact tracing is a term that we've coined to describe how location information complements the contact tracing process by accounting not only for identifiable contacts, people, um, but also for places in the community where cases have visited. This provides some huge benefits. By including location in our contact tracing workflows, we can uncover new insights about community transmission and see where new infections may be occurring. That allows us to focus our investigations and take targeted action in those places that are driving new infections. So here's an example from just eight days ago, uh, noted in the LA Times. So the title of this July 22nd article is Coronavirus Surge Linked to Restaurants in Mammoth Lakes, Lands County on the State Watch List. Well, Mammoth Lakes is in Mono County, California, which actually has previously been less affected from COVID-19 than many other places across the state and across the country. However, recently they had a big surge, which has been traced back to the July 4th holiday weekend, in which people really sought to get away from it all and uh, get back to nature, probably figuring that the great outdoors was pretty safe. But people have to eat, and 65% of the new cases were determined to be related to restaurant operations. So why is that knowledge important to Mono County and the Mammoth Lakes community? Well, the public health officials have been able to focus additional safety measures where they're needed most. For example, now all local restaurant employees are going to be required to wear protect, personal protective equipment, uh, such as surgical or N95 masks, as opposed to the lower level options like cloth face coverings. The county is also going to require some testing of restaurant employees, as well as screening of all employees before each shift. And by the way, ESRI can help with automating that screening process as well, and I'll just have you look for a blog about that next week. Anyway, according to this article, a restaurant's failure to comply with the guidance will result in closures and potentially fines. So, place matters, whether it's a restaurant, a meatpacking plant, or a textile manufacturing facility. And gaining that early insight about high-risk places can significantly supplement the good work of public health departments in stemming transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in a community. Before I start moving into the steps for community contact tracing, I did want to spend a few minutes clarifying what this approach is not. Community contact tracing is not about using GPS on your smartphones to track individual movements and then automatically notify people if they've been in close proximity to a case. Some governments have done this successfully, and it certainly can lead to quick identification of contacts and the use of fewer human resources to get that work done. But many countries may not find the idea of tracking acceptable, even under these extraordinary conditions. Another concern is that GPS is actually not the best way to identify close contacts because there are so many opportunities to get false positive results. So imagine you have two people on opposite sides of a wall or a window, or two cars that are stopped next to each other waiting for a train to pass. These aren't really contacts, but they are in close proximity and a GPS device wouldn't know the difference. This is also not about creating an app where residents sign in, contribute their location and test result information, and expect to be notified if their Bluetooth indicates they've been in close contact with a case. 
This approach not only suffers from the false positive problem, but it also requires broad participation to be successful. I am aware of uh, some jurisdictions trying to implement this without much luck, seeing somewhere around a 2 to 4 percent population participation rate. The approach that we're going to talk about today is much simpler and a lot less invasive. So let's dive in and discuss how we take the traditional process and move to community contact tracing. As I mentioned, we'll cover the three major steps involved from collecting and managing data to performing analytics and, man, uh, and developing that insight that helps with both decision making and evaluation of your entire process. So that first step is about collecting and managing the data. So our initial thinking about the data collection piece was focused on simply collecting locations as a part of the contact tracing interview process. Now this would include the home addresses of cases and contacts, of course, but it also includes the addresses of places that a person has visited such as the specific stores, offices, coffee shops, and restaurants. As you probably know, this information is often not collected at all, uh, and when it is collected, it's in a very nonspecific kind of way. What you're seeing on screen is the CDC contact tracing form. In the exposure information section, which is blown up for you on the right, it asks questions like, have you traveled domestically in the last 14 days? Now, if the answer is yes, then the contact tracer is asked to fill in which state. Well, you can imagine that level of location is far too large to be useful in analysis. With small changes, contact tracers can collect the location information they need to support location-based analysis. Now, as we reviewed the scope of the entire contact tracing workflow, we expected to primarily be talking about an integration as a part of a series of solutions. Now, at a high level, it might look something like this. You start with your archiving environment, and that's your database that brings in positive test data. Um, maybe that's from your NED system, the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System or it could be from your laboratory data system. Now that feeds into your case management system, which could be Sarah Alert, ComCare, Salesforce, or a host of other options. Then your case, contact, and location information can be imported into the ESRI environment for analysis that results in intelligence that you can share through a number of information products, such as infographics, dashboards, and web applications. And while we definitely are supporting that broader integration pattern, another pattern has uh, also emerged. A number of jurisdictions that we work with wanted the ArcGIS platform to support the entire data collection and data management system. So in that scenario, ArcGIS acts as the system of record for case interviews, contact identification, contact notifications, and follow-up activities. It still acts as the system of insight for any kind of analytics, including location analytics for community contact tracing. And it's being used as a system of engagement, providing key metrics and visualizations for various different types of stakeholders. So the second pattern that I'm talking about was actually adopted by Tri-County Health Department of Colorado. So with their epidemiologists and their GIS analysts and ESRI, uh, every step of their contact tracing process was discussed, documented, and aligned with technology, as you can see uh, kind of diagrammatically represented on the left. And the result of all this work is an operational dashboard that brings together all of the necessary functionality in this single workspace that's shown on the right. And so my colleague Jonathan is going to demonstrate some of the key components of the contact tracing data collection and management process. So Jonathan, let me turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Esti. Let me start sharing my screen here. There you go. Can you see my screen? Yes, I see it. Thank you. Um, yes, as Esti mentioned, an efficient data management process is critical whenever we talk about contact tracing. Most of your organizations are feeding your contact tracing processes from information coming from systems similar to the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System, also known as NETS. Now, there are many ways to import NETS information into RDIS. Some of you are implementing manual processes where you work side by side with NETS and you are collecting individual cases. Others are generating CSV reports from NETS and are taking advantage of the batch update capabilities within the platform. Here, for example, I have a task in RDIS Pro and I just need to hit start to this task, run the process, select my CSV file coming from NETS, click start, hit finish, and now this information is pre-populated in my RGIS layer. Once the information is in the system, the case coordinator will be able to see that there are new cases in the system. On the right side of this dashboard, you can see that we have these new cases in red. Now let's start collecting one case. Uh, let's select this one, Quentin Modelson. Using the case workload chart on the bottom part of this dashboard, you can see that Amy is the case investigator with the least amount of cases. So let's assign this case to Amy. Let's go ahead and select Amy, hit submit. And now Amy, our case investigator, will be notified of this new assignment on her desktop app. Let's check that notification. Let's go ahead and open the case app. There you go. And our case investigator will go ahead to the application and check for new assignments. Let me minimize this. There you go. So you can see here that Quentin is part of these new assignments. I can go ahead and start with this case investigation. And you can see now that the username is linked to this case investigation. This is really important for data verification purposes. You can also see that information is pre-populated in our system. This definitely will reduce time during the investigation process. Since now I am calling this person, I can verify if this information is correct. Now let's go ahead and start with our case investigation. First, I will start collecting some signs and symptoms that this case is presenting. Let's start with the first date this person shown uh, symptoms. Let's go ahead and select July 20. Then we can start collecting symptoms. Go ahead and select chills and change. And here, after collecting symptoms, the user has the capability to finalize this survey and notify the emergency department if it is evident that this case requires urgent medical attention. For now, let's skip this step. Now let's go ahead and start collecting contact information. And for this demo, I have one contact. Let's go ahead and enter information for this contact. In this case, case is Pacholan. He was exposed to this case on July 23rd. Let's enter a phone number. There you go. And um, a quick note for this contact. And also, we can start collecting locations that this case had visited after presenting symptoms. In other words, when this case was more infectious. And here, I want to highlight a really important functionality. Because 
most of our cases won't remember specific addresses of locations they visited, but most likely they will remember the name of those points of interest within their community. Here, for example, if I type Walmart, Redlands, the system automatically gets the location for, the, for that point of interest. So we we'll go ahead, register this location, and as you can imagine, I can repeat this process as many times as needed. But let's go ahead and finish this survey. Let's start with our isolation of or quarantine concerns, which basically are specific needs um, that people can have, like an employer letter or the need of social services. And finally, the system generates the recommended time frame for this case to quarantine, as well as providing an escalation option in case this case need uh, a supervisor review. So let's go ahead, finish this one, send this new investigation, and we can go to our next step, which is basically the contact investigation. So we can go ahead to the content assignment dashboard. And you can see in the list in the left side of this dashboard, the Pat Schollen is the first one in this list. And if you pay attention, you will see that these contacts are listed uh, by the date of exposure. They are ordered by the date of exposure. And this is important because we want to prioritize those contacts that have the earliest date so we can minimize their potential spread of the virus. So let's go ahead, select batch challenge. Again, we will use our case workload chart. We can see that Brad now is the one with the least amount of cases. So we select Brad, Sunit, and now our contact investigator can go ahead to the desktop app. Let's minimize this one. Let's start with the contact investigation. Select the new assignments. We have here Pat Shalom. And it's a very similar process. The information is pre populated. We can start collecting uh, the address of this specific contact, as well as signs and symptoms. It's improving in this case. A specific location that they have visited. And then we can submit this contact investigation. Now, as a parallel process, the contact tracing coordinator will be able to see the status of every case and every contact. As you can see, there are some contacts that are in the status of wellness check monitoring. That means that all those contacts with a complete investigation will receive a new, uh, a new daily notification link. And now users using this link will be able to access a web app where they can self-report their updates and validate how many more days they are recommended to quarantine. For this, they don't need to install anything on their devices to be in contact with the health department. And those are some of the key components of the contact tracing data collection process. Back to you, Esti. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate that. All right, my screen shared. Okay, well, now we're going to turn our attention to the analytics piece, which is really my favorite part, and it's the part where location information brings enhanced value to the whole contact tracing process. So when we have collected those locations in our contact tracing efforts, we can take that information, even if it comes in a simple spreadsheet, and we can put it on a map, marking the very beginning step in our spatial analysis. The first analytic function that we might want to perform is a density analysis, which is visualized here on screen as a heat map, possibly providing some early clues about higher risk locations. 
then moving on to link analysis, that gives us a better understanding of those person-to-person -person connections. Even better, when we pull in the location data in our link analysis, we can easily add measures of centrality, which comes from a, one of the components of graph theory, to determine the strength of person-to-person-to-place connections. Well, and then there are several ways to go even deeper with location to quickly provide additional evidence to either support or refute a particular place as being higher risk. Now, one way to dive deeper is to pull in social mobility data from the Living Atlas of the World. This mobility data is a free resource that can tell you the current levels of visitation for points of interest all across the country. So in Jonathan's next demonstration, he's going to show you how link analysis and centrality work, and then he'll take that more detailed look at the data to see what other kinds of useful information he can derive. So Jonathan, back to you. Okay, thank you, Esty. Let me again start sharing my screen here. And definitely this is my favorite part, <laughs> as you can imagine, Esty. Uh, but basically, what you are seeing here is RGIS Pro. And using RGIS, we can import now our contact tracing information to quickly visualize their locations on a map. The red dots here represent confirmed positive cases. And the number in the middle represents the degree of separation from the initial three cases. The gray dots are trace contacts that have not tested positive at this time. To quickly check if there is any special patterns, we can filter this information to only check the confirmed cases and create a hotspot analysis. We can go ahead here into a specific area where we have a, a cluster of confirmed cases. And then there is an important point uh, to mention because whenever you are working uh, within the S3 platform, you also have access to many relevant data sets. Here, for example, using the SafeGraph point of interest map layer, I can see that all these cases, 13 confirmed cases, are in and around a skilled nursing facility. So now let's continue our analysis by creating a link chart. Let me go ahead to the next step. And here we have a visual representation on how confirmed contacts are linked to every other uh, case in the map. Now, if I change the, ar the arrangement of this, let me go ahead here, select a different arrangement. Now I can see clearly that Wheeler has been in contact with Colin, Colleen has been in contact with Madeline and Madeline with Sarah. But also, I can see a few concerning cases, like this one here, Michelle. She just tested positive, and you can see that she is the only confirmed case with nobody in between the contacts with a confirmed positive case. Since there is no identified positive contact link, there is a likely chance that she might have contracted the disease from an unknown incidental source. That means somewhere else in her community. Now let's explore this deeply by filtering our data set to only show cases like Michelle. And we have this map. You can see that these cases are all spread the community. Let's bring in another set of points, which are the places that these specific contacts visited during the last two weeks. And using this information, let's create uh, another link chart. I just want to make an important point here. Uh, most likely contacts won't know who they were in contact with in these public places places, but they will know where they visited during the last two weeks. Now, using this link chart, you can see that some people apparently has visited unique places. 
this is the only contact that visit this dot of place here, for example. But if I go to the center of the diagram, you can see that uh, a good portion of these confirmed cases visited a common store named Homeplus. But this kind of analytics are not only visual. Actually, I can go ahead to my link analysis tool, select centrality, execute the tool, and now I can see that effectively Homeplus is indeed a high impact node that may link multiple cases. I can even select this element in the map. Let me select this with the selection tool. And now if I go back to the map, you can see the connectivity between all these contexts and that specific location. And taking advantage now of the safe graph point of interest layer, you can see that Homeplus has a high volume of visitors. You see here, it has more than 600 visitors during the last week. So it's clear that you, know, you are really bringing context to the content of your contact tracing system. Now, these kind of capabilities are not only um, you know, in our desktop applications. You also can take advantage of these capabilities using a web browser. Here, for example, I have insights for RDIS. You can see that I have my map that is showing the places that have been reported by these contacts. And now I can quickly select my contacts IDs, the locations they visited, and quickly create a link chart. It takes a couple of clicks to create that link chart. And now you can see in blue places and in orange contacts. Now, the bigger the circle, let me maximize this. The bigger the circle in the case of places, the higher the number of contacts that have reported visiting that place during the last two weeks. In the case of contacts, the bigger the circle, the higher the mobility. That means that this contact visited many places. But with insights, I definitely can focus my efforts on those places and contacts that represent the higher potential community transmission risk. Here, for example, I will go ahead, select place, and now I will create a column chart. Then I can go ahead and filter this chart by the number of contacts that reported being in that place. Let's say more than 10. I can order this, and now I have my top five places with a higher potential community transmission risk. I can go ahead and click here in the chart, Home Plus, and you can see how the link chart and the map are completely interconnected. But maybe you want to explore also temporal trends. Here in Insights, you can quickly select place. You can select the date. In this case, we will select date of the week. And then I can create a heat chart. Quickly using this heat chart, you can see if I filter this, that for Home Plus, we have a high number of visitors during the weekend. Finally, maps are powerful tools to communicate data. So I want to create a set of maps that allow decision makers to identify any clusters of positive contacts and also to understand uh, the vulnerable populations distribution around those areas. So I will use I will use a couple of very powerful capabilities that you will find in the RDS platform. No matter if you are using RDS Pro or Insights, you will find these capabilities. The first one is called aggregation. So here, for example, I have a blog group layer 
We just need to drag and drop that layer. Let me put this in the middle here so you can see it clearly. And now I just need to go ahead to my context locations, drag that layer here, and like a spatial aggregation, run the tool. And now we have a new layer that is showing the number of visits per census block. That was really quick. The second functionality is called the enrichment. This is really powerful because you, you can access a vast number of variables. You can understand your community. So here I will go to enrich data, go to the data browser, select United States. There you go. And now I will type here senior. So you can see that it's filtering that information. And now we will select senior population, which is vulnerable population in this case. I'll go ahead and then run the tool. And quickly, you can see how we will get a new layer. Let me maximize this so you can see this clearly. Change the symbology, select in this case, senior population. And there you go, we have two new layers. The first one is showing the number of visitors or positive contacts that are visiting those places. And the second layer, the green dots are showing vulnerable population. Using this same methodology, we put together, you can put together a dashboard like this one. Here you can see that we have three different maps. The first one is showing positive contacts visits per block group. The second one is showing vulnerability uh, information. And this is based on different social determinants of health that we are bringing from the platform using your enrichment. The last one is using a safe graph layer that is measuring social distancing. Here, for example, if I click in this block group, you can see that it has a, a, a high number of visits. It's dark, has a high number of visits by context, a high vulnerability index, as well as a low social distancing score. So this looks like a potential scenario for community spread of COVID. And this is just one example of how location can enhance your contact tracing process, providing your stakeholders of tools that can support the implementation of more targeted policies and effective resources for the community. Back to USD. Thanks, Jonathan. I just, I just love it. Um, okay, so the third step in the community contact tracing process is to be able to evaluate and make decisions. So leaders need to know if the contact tracing process is working well and if it's working efficiently. And one of the key drivers of using technology at all is to be able to automate and scale processes to make them more efficient. Uh, otherwise, why do it? So in contact tracing, this is especially important as uh, is being explained in this graphic that comes from Johns Hopkins University's COVID-19 contact tracing course that they're currently offering on Coursera. Now they're using that uh, dark orange red area to show the window of opportunity for contact tracing, which on average is three days. And that marks the time between when the contact was in close contact with the case and the average five day incubation period before they show symptoms. Now we know that people are infectious for two days before they come, become symptomatic. So we only have that three day period to make a connection with the contact and help them to quarantine. So we need to monitor the process to get at those key metrics. 
Well, we've been looking to the organization Resolve to Save Lives, which is led by former CDC director, Dr. Tom Frieden, for some of the key indicators about the process, which they've really nicely outlined on their website. Those indicators can be kept up to date in a dynamic dashboard. And, you know, having this level of visibility is going to help to identify and coach contact tracers that maybe aren't uh, keeping up or hiring new contact tracers if the workload is the problem or identifying other bottlenecks in the system which could be impacting the efficiency and therefore the effectiveness of the entire process. So Jonathan is going to show you some of those key metrics uh, that are being tracked in his contact tracing dashboard. So back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Esti. Let me start again sharing my screen. And I have here a dashboard based on demo data. But as Esti mentioned, effective contact tracing depends on the timeliness of case identification, case isolation, and quarantine of contacts. What you're seeing here is an executive dashboard that provides metrics related to these three essential categories. Here, for example, we can see that 73% of new cases have been reported within 24 hours of the specimen collection. This shows that we have a good case identification process. However, only 38% of these cases are being interviewed within 24 hours of their reporting. So we may like to explore, explore our process to see if there is any bottleneck. Because really, it's really important for us to ensure effective case isolation. Finally, you can see that we have additional metrics, such as the percentage of contacts that require social services, and the percentage of contacts that require out of home isolation quarantine or quarantine. We can filter our map in the left by clicking to in any on any of these charts. For example, I can click here. And then we can see in the map where are the best resources to cover those needs. This is just one of the many examples on how you can monitor the performance of your contact tracing process. There are many ways to evaluate the effectiveness of your contact tracing system, as well as of supporting the prioritization of your activities. The point here is that using the RGIS platform, you have a flexible environment where you can configure powerful dashboards to support stakeholders within the organization. Back to USD. All right, I think we're in the final stretch here. Well, I hope that uh, you're able to see how community contact tracing really supplements your traditional contact tracing workflows to deliver clear benefits. With community contact tracing, you can find commonalities and patterns in your case data. You can understand how cases and contacts and places are connected, which is going to give you new actionable insights about community spread. So perhaps this is a direction that your organization may be interested in pursuing. Well, if that is the case, then I suspect that one of the first questions you might ask is whether this contact tracing solution is HIPAA compliant. Well, that is, of course, a really important question, but it's actually not as simple as a yes or no answer. I think it's really critical for those of you that may be considering this approach to first evaluate the concept of HIPAA compliance in a very holistic way. In other words, we need to remember that the term HIPAA compliance refers to more than just the software system. It's also about the people who are trained and they adhere to the privacy and security processes laid out by your organization. Well, to determine on the software side if this solution is right for your organization, the first step is to decide whether you would consider the data that you're collecting 
to be personally identifiable information, that's PII, or protected health information, PHI. So I'm gonna define both of those for you. So PII is information that can identify a specific individual or can be linked to a specific individual. PII is subject to security and privacy regulations, which actually vary by jurisdiction, but it doesn't directly fall under HIPAA protections. Now, interestingly, in some cases, PII may even be stored with a limited amount of health information, which some organizations classify as PII with health information rather than classifying it as PHI. Now, moving on to PHI, this is a subset of PII that includes health information that can also be linked to a specific individual. PHI does fall under HIPAA protections, as well as any relevant regulations for PII, because remember, it's uh, under that umbrella. HIPAA protections um, apply to HIPAA-covered entities, and that includes healthcare providers, health plans, or healthcare clearinghouses. State, county, and local health departments may be considered covered entities, but not in all cases. In addition, uh, disease surveillance and outbreak response activities, like contact tracing, are not covered functions under HIPAA, and the data related to these activities is actually not typically classified as PHI. So there's a lot to consider, and this classification of your data is really an organizational decision for you to make. But once you have made that decision, we can talk about the different ESRI environment options. So if you consider your contact tracing data as PII, ArcGIS Enterprise is gonna satisfy your privacy and security requirements, and ArcGIS Online may do so as well. ArcGIS Online adheres to many of the same requirements for privacy and security that HIPAA would require. And these features also definitely make ArcGIS Online better than paper forms, spreadsheet-based uh, processes, and files stored on a local computer or device, which uh, actually are usually unencrypted. Now, if you classify your contact tracing data as PHI, a lot of our customers often choose to deploy ArcGIS Enterprise since the PHI remains in their own infrastructure, giving them a little more control in how ArcGIS is configured in their environment. Um, but if you want a SaaS solution for your PHI, you can evaluate the security and privacy features of ArcGIS Online to decide if it does, in fact, meet your requirements. Now, to help you do that evaluation, I'm including this slide to provide you with a number of resources related to ESRI security practices, as well as two white papers at the bottom, one helping with network accessibility while you have employees that may still be working outside of the office, and also privacy best practices. Very good to review these. Um, we're going to send these resources with the webinar recording so you will have them to review. And here's a few more resources to supplement your knowledge of community contact tracing, including a short blog that I wrote and a video demonstration of the link analysis process. So I really want to say thank you to everyone for spending this time with us and uh, especially for the great work that you all do every day. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to see if we have any questions. All right, perfect. Thank you both. So we do have quite a number of questions here, and we have about 10 minutes to get to them, so I'll start off right away. The first question is, how long does it take to stand up this system for a health department? Uh, that's a great question, and I know that this is uh, new to all of us, um, but I'll use the Tri-County uh, Health Department example. Uh, their installation took about two months from start to finish, and that included a lot of creation of the process. So I would say that uh, we've gotten much faster from that initial conceptualization. So something under two months. And is this still beneficial as 
the, this question is from Allison, I, sh I should say. Is this still beneficial as the COVID cases in my area decrease or is it too late to implement? Well, that's a really good question. So in the, the research that I've done, um, you basically can look at the r naught, which is the replication rate of the virus in a society where everybody is susceptible, right, uh, in sort of the perfect world. And if you can decrease r naught and save a number of infections, then you've been uh, really good. So in contact tracing, uh, we look at the current replication rate as um, an infected person it usually infects two to three people, so let's say two. So if your contact tracing process, um, even if there's a smaller number of infections, can reduce that to one, so each infected person only infects one other person, then actually over three cycles, you've reduced 73% of infections. So it can be very valuable, but um, I definitely would keep in mind the level of effort as well. So I'd say you have to have a fair number of cases, but you don't have to have um, you know, a complete epidemic. Remember that this is often used when there's just a few cases mm -hmm. of uh, HIV or uh, tuberculosis um, to stop that transmission chain. I have just a quick comment there, and I think that uh, this methodology is not only a reactive methodology, methodology it's it's it can be used you know more like a way to control also the, the increase of cases basically through case isolation and quarantine of, of contacts we can make sure that they are not it's not increasing great point perfect and this question is for you jonathan it says i'm a pretty strong arcgis pro user but i don't have arcgis insights do i need to purchase insights to do the analytics part Oh, that's a good question. Well, the good news is that whether you are using ArcGIS Pro or Insights, you can take advantage of link charts, your enrichment, data aggregation. Those are functionalities that are all across the platform. I think that the only thing to consider always is who will be using that application. Is it a GIS expert in this case, or it is uh, maybe an API? So that's the way we can choose what is the tool we, we want to offer. And I have a question here from Nick. He says, do you have to use data based on NEDS? I'm picturing needing to contact trace for a handful of staff members uh, like paramedics or first responders instead of a larger community. So, um... Uh, one of the things we sort of breezed over, but we've seen in other jurisdictions, is some people are keeping track of their case information on a spreadsheet. Um, literally, that's enough. If you've, if you've got a way to collect the information and you can get it into a spreadsheet or a CSV, um, then you can do community contact tracing. Yes. All right, and another question from uh, Carl. In the community linking analysis for contacts, are the locations visited by the cases, i.e. before they are tested and started isolating, included in the analysis? Uh, in, in this case, yes, because the SUBI basically it's configuring a way that you start collecting uh, locations two days before this contact or this case is presenting symptoms. And then you have 10 days of that time frame, the time frame that ST is shown in that chart. That, that, by the way, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, and yes, the, the survey is basically limiting the collection, but you can configure the survey as you need, basically. Yeah, we basically wanted to make sure that we're focusing on the cases infectious period. Um, and so, you want to be careful about the the time frame, as Jonathan said, that you're collecting um, any of the places visited. I think if you collect more outside of what is known about the infectious period, you could introduce noise. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and then this question's from uh, Allison. It says, I am based out of a rural location. Is there a way to use GIS tracing when the home address uh, doesn't even show up on Google Maps. That's for you, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a very very interesting question, and 
to be honest, it's, um, it's one of the challenges we are seeing in different organizations. But I would, what I would say is this, uh, you don't need you know, the specific address most of the time. If you have a zip code, if you have the name of a city, if you have a point of interest, our geocoders are really powerful and we definitely can get as close as possible using uh, the information we have. And that, that definitely would enhance your process. We guarantee you. We, we are seeing the results of that. So that's like if you take a spreadsheet and pull it in and you want to geocode it. But Jonathan, I think if somebody were to use your Survey123 app and they have that location uh, tab in their feature and they want to move the pin around, if they can recognize their area you know, from that mm -hmm. mapped view, but even a, a satellite image, they could actually pinpoint their location if they wanted to. All right, and this one I like. This is not a question. This is a true or false statement. So it's uh, this is from uh, Justin, and he says, success of community contact tracing primarily depends on the success of contact tracing interviews. True or false? True. <laughs> All right. <Good. laughs> there we go. Got one down. All right, and then this one's from uh, Rashmi. Uh, how does the contact tracing work in case the person is infected but is asymptomatic? Uh, well, if they're so, uh, they still have. Um, huh, well, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a second. So they're infected, positive test, asymptomatic. I think they're probably treated like a quarantine for two weeks. Um, I'd have to go back to my contact tracing notes, but okay. I think that's the answer um let's see there's been a few that have come in um okay so this one's from dre he says graduation parties ceremonies etc as well as youth sports bars and restaurants are a bit more relaxed in their distancing um, and mask policies how does this affect privacy for home or other private addresses so maybe speaking towards uh privacy of data Mm -hmm. these types of gatherings it, yeah I was wondering if it was privacy of data or um, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure of the question because the first thing that came to mind was you know you could live in a place with uh, multiple roommates or multiple family members and uh, really if you uh, for the public health if you are tested positive you should isolate yourself within that home. If you can't have your own bedroom and your own bathroom, then the state or the local public health department can help you find a place to safely isolate and get the services and food and other things that you need to uh, get through that infectious period. Um, if the question was about privacy, once a case is identified, um, when we do the contact tracing, we never say who the case is. I think if you live with somebody, that'll be hard to overcome. But uh, but the whole interview process is confidential, and and people will not uh, I will not reveal who the initial case was that they connected with. I hope yes, one I of those answers answered the question. <laughs> yes, if we come in, uh, I would say that this is the process that is the least you know invasive. Uh, we are not tracking people. We are basically calling people and if they are willing they are sharing information so definitely it's it's a process that is um to get traction people feel more comfortable just sharing information for the sake of the health of the community and we are enhancing that process all right i think we have time for a few more so this one's from roman he asks uh using this analysis could we identify slash isolate cases that come from outside and tested positive at border controls, like airport or you know border entry points. So absolutely, because of the exposure questions, I think you uh, would find where people are coming from, moving. If it was within that uh, time period, that is of concern. Um, and it is sort of interesting once you get through the process. Like if you identify a contact in there. 
they're moving. So they could be like literally moving to a new place and it just happens to coincide with the time that they're meant to be quarantined. Um, there is some transfer of uh, that person needs to then be followed by the new health department in their new jurisdiction. So um, it may be sort of a temporary um, view into the data and then another department takes over. But uh, yes, the exposure questions should answer whether or not they've come from somewhere, somewhere else. Do you have something to add, Jonathan? Yes, a quick comment. Uh, I don't know who asked that question, but we can talk to you. We are already working with some uh, customers and, and on a projects absolutely related to that. Perfect. Very good. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us, and we hope uh, everyone found this informational. And like SD says, we will follow up with everyone uh, with the presentation, the recording, and some additional resources. So thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.